Welcome to Unity Now, the podcast where we discuss unity in the face of division. Inspired by the Unity 2020 plan, we strive to unite Americans by highlighting the middle ground between the two dominant parties and promoting the individual over groups. Each episode, we will bring you exciting, well-informed guests and host nuanced conversations about politically charged subjects. Our goal is to bring an end to the ideological war threatening the collective well-being of this great country. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host today, Toby Davis. Joining us today is Phil Reeves. Phil has worn many hats throughout his life, screenwriter, author, actor, police officer, and most recently, police chaplain. He wrote the screenplay for the 1999 film, Happy Texas, and he wrote the play from the Journal of Hazard Macaulay. And if he looks familiar to you, you may have seen him in the feature films about Schmidt and Election, among many others. Or you may have seen him on several television series, including Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Parks and Recreation, and he's currently on the ABC series, Home Economics. It should also be said that Phil played the part of Vice President Andrew Doyle on the series Veep for HBO. In the future, we at Unity Now Podcast hope to interview current politicians that exemplify the need to put people above parties. But for now, we're thrilled to have on as our guest someone who, while is not a politician, at least he plays one on TV. Please welcome to our show, Phil Reeves. Hey, Toby. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so if you wouldn't mind, add anything you want to that introduction. Otherwise, we will get right into it. I think I'm good to go. Um, Yeah, I'm good to go. I think you cover the waterfront. Yeah, we appreciate you joining us uh, tonight. So, uh, you know, one question, if we can jump right into it. Sure, yes, sir. Uh, With your, like we just described, multitude of backgrounds, Mm. how can we better instruct the public to critically examine supposed incidents of police brutality Mm -hmm. before going to a place where the officer is automatically guilty? Yeah. Your thoughts? Yeah. Great question, especially now. Um, So my point of view is influenced uh, by having been a cop and also serving now as a uh, chaplain for the sheriff's department. I I ride with the deputies um, every week. uh, And so I'm still very much involved in that law enforcement world. I think really what it boils down to, uh, in my mind, is uh, due process, taking the time to find out what happened. Um, And it's interesting, um, body cams are now the thing. I think they're very helpful for a lot of different ways. But it's it's interesting to me how even uh, cameras can be uh, can distort. Uh, I remember when I was in the academy, there was, this is back in the dash cam day, uh, and there was uh, a unit responding to a call of a man with a gun in the parking lot of a, uh, of a parking lot. I mean, of a, uh, of a, like a convenience store. And so you've got two units rolling to this call. You've got the front unit roll up, and the cop gets out of the car, and through the dash cam, you can see the, the suspect. And all of a sudden, the officer opens fire on this guy, and it looks flat out like an execution. I mean, it is, it's ugly. Then you see the second camera of the, on the second unit rolling up, and he catches a side view of the suspect who has a gun down at his side. And is actually turning to bring the gun up to fire on the first officer, but you don't see that on the first officer's dash cam. So that's, I guess, kind of a dramatic example of uh, the the necessity to just uh, chill out, and to take the time to gather the facts, uh, see what really happened. I mean, police work is, as the U.S. Supreme Court said, is is very dynamic. You make life and death decisions instantaneously. Uh, And, you know, people are people. They're humans. They make mistakes. So uh, just uh, 
that's my uh, advice to folks that get swept up in the uh, the moment is just wait until the facts come in. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how much of it depends solely on perspective alone. Like you mentioned, two different cameras show two different perspectives. Yes. And then add in that all of our other perspectives, like how people already view police when they see the video. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's uh, those internal triggers are going to skew your perception. Uh, that's just the way people are. That's the way we're built. Um, and that's fine. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, those triggers need to be looked at as well. Your own internal triggers is why you jump to these conclusions in the first place. Um, it's important to, to take a look at those as well, I think, within ourselves. Yeah. So yeah. when the media, and no matter which media outlet you're looking at, when they put an extreme use of force on television or in the news, how do you think the public should go about critically examining what they see and maybe trying to look at it using only what they see and not their built-in perspectives coming into it? Well, I, I think um, there again, uh, it's forcing yourself sometimes to just take a step back and wait until you get, get, get the facts in. I mean, the beautiful thing about our world today is we have just, you know, an inundation of information and data. The tough part is sussing all that out, you know, uh, and uh, trying to determine what's trustworthy and, and what's not. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I heard an expression once that uh, our system of justice is the worst form of, you know, social organization in the world, except for all the rest. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I, I uh, you know, courts make mistakes, judges make mistakes, lawyers make mistakes, cops make mistakes, everybody makes mistakes. Uh, but I, I, I like to believe and I have hope and I have faith that, um, you know, um, our, our process of justice uh, and due process uh, will eventually uh, suss these things out, I think. Uh, you know, we've seen that recently in a lot of very high profile um, use of force cases. And then what are your thoughts on the quote unquote defund the police movement? You know, how do we get people from going all the way to that kind of perspective? And what does defund the police even mean when it's used in that context? Yeah, so. It's a great point. It has different meanings for different people. The way I take it is you're going to take uh, funding away from police training and recruitment of good people. Um, I personally think that uh, even if you were to defund, not give the police a penny, you'd end up with cops. There still has to be cops. But the cops you'd have wouldn't be the kind of cops you'd want to have. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, you, that would tend to bring in people that, uh, whose judgment would be suspect. Um, ironically, I think that, uh, more funds are needed as long as they ensure, uh, uh, good training. Uh, and I think a big part of that is, the baseline is finding, I believe that cops are made in the recruitment. In other words, that you have to find good people in the first place. You can train up a bad person extremely well and they're not gonna be a good cop. Uh, you may be able to train up a good person uh, not well and they'll be a good cop. Um, so I think that's where the, where the magic happens. <laughs> is finding good people who want to be cops in the first place. Um, there's a politician, and I forget his name, in Northern California that talked about um, maybe the idea of not bringing people into police work until they're either 25 or have a bachelor's degree. Um, and I think that's a, great, that's a great idea. I really do. I mean, I think, um, Police work requires maturity. 
and requires uh, mature judgment. And um, so anything we can do to enhance that and reward that and cultivate that is, is, a, good, is a good thing to do. Um, and also, interestingly enough, I'm, I'm just finishing up uh, a book uh, by uh, um, uh, Bessel van der Kirk called uh, The Body Keeps the Score. It's about uh, trauma. And uh, interestingly enough, in, in, in police work and among soldiers, too, people that are that that are, you know, whose business is ugly. Um, soldiers that have uh, are older come to do the soldiers work, come to do law enforcement work when they're older or have more education, have a bigger perspective. And so they're less susceptible or prone to traumatic stress as well. Um, and, you know, uh, anything we can do to, 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 to bring the temperature down in any given situation, that's a good thing. That is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So even with bringing in mature people and beginning them right at the starting point, at the right starting point, is there still a point where someone has enough incidents or issues, even if it's not self-inflicted or they are at fault or they're not at fault for some incident? You know, is there still a point of no return for a police officer mm -hmm. you know, who potentially has had too many traumatic incidents or too many uses of deadly force? You know, where psychologically they're potentially not fit to be on the streets anymore or there should just be a better evaluations. What are your thoughts there? Yeah. So I think it depends on the person. Uh, it's hard. I, I would be reluctant to come up with a you know one size fits all means of judging that in, in somebody. Um, I think, again, if someone a, comes to the job with some maturity and uh, large perspective on life, um, they're able to self-regulate when they're getting in too deep, maybe can pull back from it a little bit. Um, I think that, uh, I, I, I think that, uh, I'll just, my personal example is, uh, I retired from law enforcement in 2013 uh, spent a couple of years trying to just kind of uh, suss out or filter through a lot of my experiences that I'd had, you know, a lot of ugly experiences, a lot of stuff that happened. Um, and um, my motivation to become a police chaplain uh, is, uh, and so there's different kind of chaplaincies in law enforcement. Mine is patrol chaplaincy, where I actually get in the car and I ride with people and we're out, you know, uh, you know, on patrol, dealing with situations as they come up. And, and a lot of what I do in that capacity is just suss out where the officer is at. You know, we talk about all kinds of things, you know, issues in their life, personal issues in their life, um, things that are going good, things that are going not good. And we can, you know, uh, hopefully um, in that discussion, um, and there's been a couple times actually that this has happened that I've said, hey, you know, Maybe we should talk to some other folks about about, you know, where you're at emotionally with in your life, uh, because you have to have emotional stability to do good police work. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that's a big part of it. Uh, there's something else I was thinking I wanted to say, but I don't remember what it was. Well, what are your thoughts from that training perspective? on sort of a national training being rolled out that is done the same way everywhere? You know, or should training be based solely on local area, local demographic, and adjust, adjusted based on that? Have you ever ventured to other police departments in other cities and states to see how training is done there? Uh, yes, I have. Um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, state Agents, state agencies that oversee training for their police departments are re reluctant to relinquish that that control, and I, I think that's okay. Um, I think there are certain um, least common denominators that have to be met in terms of uh, you know who gets hired and what kind of training that they have. Um, so uh, y yeah, I mean I uh, I'm. I think 
it's all about finding whatever means you can to create the largest possible human perspective in cops out on the street. Um, because, uh, as I mentioned before, I mean, you make you have to make a lot of um, split second de decisions under incredibly stressful situations. Uh, you know, a lot of death, a lot of blood, like right there in front of you right now. And um, so you have to be able to, um, you know, instill in folks a, uh, a, uh, a kind of rudder, internal moral rudder, uh, a place that they can, they can go. You know, it's interesting um, in um, uh, where people work vice, you know, and they go out and work undercover. Um, I remember one guy telling me one time is people should only work vice for like six months or a year because what happens is you get so caught up in that world, you lose you, you can lose your moral rudder, um, and so uh, I, I'm coming back to a thought I was thinking about before is that that's one of the things I I, I think that uh, I'd like to see uh, if police departments are going to defund uh, their officers, their officer trainings. Unfortunately, they're going to end up with people that they may not like as cops. And I'd like to see him put it. One of the things I have witnessed firsthand is having been a cop, you know, patrol cop in a one man car out there on the streets, shagging calls and dealing with stuff. Uh, and also being a, a police chaplain, I think there's a lot of potentiality in police chaplaincy um, for being out there in the cars with folks uh, and helping them, you know, be keep that moral rudder. Uh, keep a larger perspective on on what they're seeing, because uh, it's easy to uh, over time to become jaded and cold and um, cynical, uh, and that doesn't do anybody any good. It doesn't do the public any good, and it doesn't do yourself any good. Yeah, and in, and in so, your experience, do police yeah. departments, or at least the ones that you've been involved with, uh, do they spend enough time in continual reevaluation and retraining and checking in on the officer and updating techniques or procedures? Well, I don't think they do as as much uh, for officers' souls, if I can put it that way, as they do for you know tactical training. Uh, that's always updated, and that's a thing they call perishable skills that you have to combat training and hands-on training and scenario training and stuff like that. And that's all important. But, you know, I, I also think that um, uh, people need to be attuned to, um, you know, what's going on inside themselves um, because it's easy to lose perspective out there. Uh, it's, you know, you see a lot of ugly stuff and you see the bad side of people and it's easy to become, it's a little bit of that, uh, what's that, uh, Joseph Conrad, heart of darkness, you know, where you get kind of sucked into the, the darker side of human nature and, and you really have to work at, um, regrounding yourself, coming back to, you know, cause I believe my faith teaches me too, is that, you know, um, um, uh, you know, I, I think people are, are, are basically good. And uh, but you have to you have to work at reinforcing that point of view sometimes, you know. Yeah, we talk about this at the podcast a lot. And even in our internal team meetings, you know, we touch on grandiose topics and a lot of people that we follow. And good for you for doing that. That's that's great that you're doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're trying to bridge the divide. And even when we talk about things, you know, going back to like Hitler, mm -hmm. you know, and there are a lot of people that talk about Hitler and the Nazis and how the line of good and evil kind of is drawn right down the middle of yeah, every one of us. Absolutely. You know, and if you don't think that you could have been a guard back in the Nazi <laughs> army, Amen. well, think again. Think again. Exactly. Yep. And I can imagine that's that the right. same thing goes for police officers who, you know, depending on your beat or where you're operating every day, it could be a very terrible place to be in every single day. That's right. That's right. And I think, I think a good part of, you know, I, I like to, and I've seen cops do this or good, good cops who do this, you know, um, people that are, come from really tough situations um, need to be told that. 
they need to be told that, hey, you know what? You're, you, you're okay. You're a good person. You can, you can make this life work for you. You can, you can do good instead of just, you know, reflexively hurting other people, you know? And, uh, you know, I've, I've, uh, I'll tell you one quick war story real quick. One time I was out on patrol and stopped at this intersection. There was a guy acting kind of funny and I went and contacted him. The fight was on just instantly. And we're rolling around on the ground and I'm calling for help and I, 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 I finally get this guy under control and he was pissed. <laughs> so I hooked this guy up. He had a bunch of dope on him. Off he goes to jail. And uh, this is about six or seven months later. I'm out driving around on patrol and I come to a red light in my rearview mirror. I see this guy coming up on his bike on my passenger side. And I'm like, okay, here we go. And uh, so he comes up and he knocks on my window and I roll my window down. He goes, are you the officer that, you know, arrested me for this dope back? And he had a bunch of meth on him at the time. And I said, yeah. And he, he said, you know what? That was the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> I just almost, you know, fainted away. I mean, I because I was, you know, he was like, yeah, I, I really appreciate the fact that, you know, that intervention in his life at that time helped him turn it around. I mean, that's a rarity, obviously, but, um, you know, uh, it's you can do a lot of you can do a lot of good. That's good. Yeah. I don't know if I got off tr topic. What was it? What was, yeah. No, no. We were talking okay. about the line of good and evil. Yeah. 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 You said you retired from the police force in 2013. How many years were you on the force? So I started in 20, uh, in 2001. I started after September 11th. Uh, I, um, I was very affected by September 11th. Um, you know, the images of those people, you know, jumping off the top of that building. And it was just, I was just very affected by it. Um, but I was like 50. And uh, I thought, you know what? I wanted to, I won in the fight on this. I won in the fight. So I, you know, I thought, well, I'll see what, what's up with the armed forces. So I'm calling around to these different branches and, you know, and they're like, well, how old are you? Yeah, I'm like 50. I, uh, try the Coast Guard. <laughs> so I, I call the Coast Guard. And they're like, well, thanks, but no thanks. So I read an article in our local uh, paper that a lot of cops uh, in Burbank, California, where I lived at the time, were getting called up into the armed forces because of September 11th. So I contacted the local uh, department here and and said, hey, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm interested in helping if I could. So um, they were reluctant because of my age. I said, well, look, if I can get through the academy, will you take me on? So I was able to get through the academy and, uh, you know, um, got involved. And so 12 to 13 years roughly on the force, right? Yes. Yeah. I was exactly. I was going to ask, did it change much in that time? What were some major differences from the time you started or to even now? Because, you know, you're still involved, right? Yeah. Well, um following to you know, following September eleventh, you know, the, the culture in the country was very pro law enforcement. Um and I was happy to uh you know, that was, that was my, I guess, contribution to being in the fight in, in, in some way. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, I'm sorry, come, come back to your question one more time, I'm sorry. Just asking, how has it changed? And that's probably a good topic right there. Right. The interest in being a police officer at all. Right. Has that changed yeah, a lot? Yeah, yeah. So, um you know, it was a very pro uh, law enforcement time. Uh, and then uh, after I retired in uh, 2013, um, you know, we had the Ferguson incident and, uh, you know, George Floyd and all the rest of that stuff. So it, 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 it totally it totally flipped. Um, but, um, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, my sense of it was um, uh, there's bad apples in any profession, um, but by far the majority of people that I worked with were, you know, out to do good and, and out to help people. And um, there's tremendous potentiality in it to, to really help people out who are in the toughest situations that they've ever been in their lives. Um, but you have to, um, you have to have an anchor. You have to have a moral anchor. You have to have a, the heart for it. Um, and that's one of the things I have appreciated about, uh, uh, chaplaincy is, is, you know, um, uh, you know, reinforcing that in the guys and women that I ride along with. Because, you know, a lot of these folks get into it for the right reasons. And then uh, it's very easy, uh, you know, with that veil of authority to lose your, your compass and, and how you deal with people. And uh, it's been great to kind of help them maybe reframe what they do um, uh, you know, to, to really, really help people out who are in some tough situations, you know, the toughest situations in their life. And, you know, it doesn't surprise me that you saw it change like that. And obviously we've seen that change, you know, on TV and information um, that we have. So it's not surprising to hear. But, yeah, you've had a quite a different perspective as well with entertainment, right? Yes. In that industry. And if so if we can shift gears a little bit. Sure. Talk about the multiple hats that you've worn that are sometimes pretty politically pure camps, right? Mm. You've got Hollywood on the left and law enforcement on the right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you frequently live in both worlds simultaneously. How have you developed any insights and been able to straddle both of those worlds? Well, I've been very fortunate. Um, I work as an actor and a writer in film and television. So um, to some extent, my schedule and my you know daily routine is within my control. Um, and it allowed me the flexibility to, to work. I, when I was a cop, I, I worked full time, but I was also working full time in, in film and television as well. Yeah. And so, um, it's, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it was very gratifying. I think, uh, it, it, I, I used to tell, uh, uh, other actors that I was working with, you know, I said, you know, uh, acting, it was incredibly helpful for, for my police work and just being able to talk to people and, you know, being able to empathize and, and, uh, you know, um, uh, have some real dialogue with folks who are in a lot of pain. Um, so I, I, I actually found the two uh, disciplines or endeavors or whatever uh, very complementary <laughs> rather than antagonistic. Um, it was very, you know, it was helpful. And I appreciated, you know, uh, for being in the film and television business, you know, you talk to people all the time. Um, strangers and people you've never met before and on stage I, I i did stage for many years so uh those skills those communication skills uh came in very handy in in police work as well you know being able to uh just walk up to people that you've never met before and all of a sudden you're in the deepest darkest places in their lives you know so. Yeah, as Todd mentioned, um, and we were discussing at the front end, I live in Indiana, and there can be some very right-leaning groups in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And what I hear from those extreme groups on the right, you know, is that Hollywood, quote unquote, is on the extreme left, the liberal left, and just can't be dealt with. Right. And then what you hear from the extreme left is now that, you know, police officers are the bane of all evil. It's interesting to hear um, that you said, you know, that they complement each other. Right. Do you have any trouble in either camp politically, or how does that work? No, I think uh, I, I have not. I'm very um, non-cause, non-big group movement oriented. I'm very much person oriented. Um, 
there is a Nigerian novelist called Adiche Chimachanda, I think her name is. And she talks about, um, you know, uh, reducing things down to, you know, the personal level as much as you possibly can. Just the interaction one on one with people, you know, and the older I've gotten, um, the more that that's that that's grown important to me. I'm not a real big believer in large sweeping causes any anymore. I'm I'm just a believer in doing doing good, you know, uh, f for your neighbor. That's just basically what it boils down to for me. Uh, very personal, small, small level. Um, so you know, and I one thing I, I did appreciate about. Uh, getting into police work from, uh, you know, an acting and a writing background is two things. One, it made me comfortable, you know, jumping into any situation and, and talking to people. Uh, and, um, you know, it also made me appreciate, uh, it, it kept my perspective open in dealing with people's life stories. You know, it's really easy to project out of our own life stories, expecting everybody to be just like us in some way. And you really have to, uh, conversely, the interesting thing that uh, helped uh, in terms of police work with my acting, I think, is uh, really listening to people, really trying to listen to what's going on with them. What's, you know, what's, What's happening underneath with people? Uh, you know, were they hurting? You know, um, so that was it. Was a very you'd think they were two completely different, you know, polar spheres, but they were very much, uh, very much the same kind of stuff, you know, in a lot of ways. And it's just being with people and loving them up, and you know, as best you can, and you know, listening to what their stories are. So if I'm listening to you and hearing you right, then what you're saying is it might actually be better to deal with people on a one to one basis and not yell at people on social media with your keyboard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, whatever blows your skirt up, I mean, whatever makes you happy. But uh, in terms of, I, you know, I think if you're really going to... Um, grok you know you're really gonna to to meet someone uh where they're at in a real human way um you know you have to um set aside your filters and your preconceptions and just uh just listen to to to, to where they're at um and that's you know that's been uh, you know, part of the becoming a chaplain in law enforcement, I'm uh, you know, working on my master's degree. There's a lot of training in, involved with it. And, uh, you know, really, the, it's just, just that authentic listening to other people, just really hearing what they're saying um, has been uh, a, a challenge. It's tough. It's tough for anybody um, because, we, you know, our predilections and prejudices can be very, very subtle. Um, and, uh, but it's been, um, tremendously rewarding as well. You know, I wish in some ways, at least when I was starting out, I mean, I, I, I started law enforcement older. So I think that was an advantage, uh, in a lot of ways. I had yeah. a certain kind of maturity that, that some of these young people just don't have. Um, and I, we spoke earlier about, uh, this one guy I was talking in Northern California about, uh, cops these days. I don't know if I mentioned it or not earlier in our conversation, but uh, he was saying, you know, cops probably should um, not start until they're 25 years old. Yeah, and should ha and should have either a, a you know a, a, a BA or a BS, you know, um, or wait until they're 25. Um, and I I think there's a lot of you know there's. You know, it's not formulaic, but I think there's a lot of wisdom in that because uh, it, gives you, it gives you some maturity uh, that uh, I appreciated maybe having that a lot of my younger colleagues did, did not have, you know, reactivity, less reactivity and really trying to listen to what other people are telling you. Yeah. Um, you know, because in police work, you know, you're dealing with 
very dynamic situations and they can very traumatic stuff going on like right now and you know people are in shock and they can't you know they you know there's a, a kind of a thing that uh, a formula that you know people in deep trauma can only process maybe five percent of what they're hearing they just can't you can't process it yeah. um and so you have to be able to navigate that world and that requires some maturity i think yeah for sure it's interesting, you know, do you experience any trouble or ever hear anyone in Hollywood, Hollywood circles that are saying things like defund the police or calling out the police? Or is that just another big spin by the media that we constantly hear about? I think it, you know, in my experience and, you know, it's limited. It's, it's just my perspective, one person's perspective. Um, it's. It, it, it just boils down to the, the, the personal interaction between two people. It's so easy for us to leap out of these personal interactions between two people into uh, gross, uh, you know, judgments about large groups of people. And it's, 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 it's very unfair. Uh, and, um, you know, I, even with uh, the young cops, cops I ride, I ride with, and, you know, lots of times we were like, hey, you know, let's step back from the situation. Let's see what's really kind of going on here. Let's let's try not to, you know, judge this. Uh, and also, I've also dealt with, I've been in situations on patrol where, you know, people have come up and gotten to a cop's grill and started, you know, and I've taken them aside and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, let's, <laughs> let's decompress this a little bit, yeah. take a broader perspective on what's happening. Um, and um, it's not easy, man. It's, it, it's, 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 a, it's a discipline We you know, you have to, you have to come back to that. You know, it's like taking a breath. Let's get a larger perspective on the situation right now. And um, um, so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, you know, encountered that somewhat on occasion with people I work with on the set or something, if they find out I'm a retired cop or whatever, but it, you know, um, I've also had people, you know, afterwards, well, you know, I, I felt like just that one-on-one -on -one interaction, you know, they're human, I'm human, you know, uh, is, is maybe changed their, their, uh, you know, knee jerk negative response to a whole category of people called cops or whoever it is you're dealing with. I mean, you know, um, anytime you get into those kind of group judgments you're you're getting into that's uh that's scary waters to be in for sure yeah your advice there for taking a step back and surveying a situation probably should be applied to all social media posts and all news that everyone hears about right right before you make any judgments or any decisions on you know based on what you're seeing give yourself some time Listen to other sources that could, and that could go yeah. a long way into changing people's minds, or at least not making them up so fast in the first place, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, but don't get me wrong. I mean, there are some some bad actors out there. Yeah. Um, and you're not going to change their minds, and you know, for whatever reason, you know, they're bad actors. I, I'm, I'm. Who am I to judge? But you know, for most people, um, I found. You know, uh, in our t today's political climate, I I'm wondering. You know, they, their, their, their goals are the same. Their roots to the goal are can be different, and because the roots are different, they think their goals are not the same. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's really important to just take time. I, I, I think you know, uh, and step back from the conversation and 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 just kind of figure out. Um, you know where the other person is coming from. It's 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 been an interesting process. I'm I'm working on a master's in theology, and um, theological language is incredibly laden with meaning and emotion. Yeah, there's all these different levels. You know, God, sin, grace, all of these different things. You know, and I've when I started the, 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 that process of study, I, I just kind of thought, well, sin, this, you know, sin is sin, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, repentance and things like this. 
But now in these discussions that I have, theological discussions I have uh, with folks um, in my chaplaincy capacity, a lot of times I'll just say, hey, let's hold, before we start, let's kind of de deconstruct this verbiage here. Yeah. What does, you know, what's the God of your understanding? What is sin of your understanding? You know, and so um, it's really important to kind of um, try to, I think, suss out a, a common vocabulary and, and its meaning before you start taking on these larger issues, you know, social justice and, and uh, you know, all of these larger, you know, uh, issues that are causing a lot of contention in our society these days. Because I really do believe, and perhaps I'm naive, is that, that, you know, peoples in general, people share the same good intentions. Um, it's just that they have very different means as perhaps as to how to achieve th those goals. And uh, that's where the that's where the friction happens, you know. Um, you may have a different way of going about something. And so I'm going to judge you negatively for that. But I, I'm not taking the time to sit down with you and say, hey, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, what's going on with you? We're let's let's take a second. Let's pause, take a breath here and 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 uh, dig into what what we mean by what we're saying here right now. You know, because I, I, I my sense is there's a lot more commonality out there than not if people are willing to just take the time to you know slow it down and uh and, and really and, uh, talk to each other you know so yeah that's great like thank you cents. i have like five questions that popped out of everything you just said um, but i'll try to keep it short uh from my perspective you know being 41 looking back at me 20 years ago you um, don't look a day over 40 brother <laughs> You as well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I got a couple days over 40, but thank you very much. Go ahead. Yeah. And obviously, you know, you know, you're studying for your master's and you're pursuing all these things, which is great to hear. And it's like, I want to ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because it doesn't sound like you're done, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'll start there. What what led you to pursue the master's degree and why do it in theology? So, um after I retired from law enforcement in 2013, I, I was a philosophy student in college. And, um, you know, I kind of wanted to take some time to um, get some perspective on my experiences in, as a cop, I think. Because hmm. um, I'd seen a lot of stuff that was, you know, ugly and brutal and cold. And so I kind of my default position was to go back to philosophy, which was a larger perspective on things. And uh, there's a series of book by uh, author called Copleston, it's called the history of philosophy. And I'd been reading through these this huge <laughs> bunch of books. And so I went back and I kind of jumped into um, medieval theology, the scholastics and stuff like that. Wow. Yeah. And really back in those days, philosophy and theology were the, were the same thing to try to, uh, you know, get some perspective on what, uh, what I'd seen hmm. and what I had experienced. Um, uh, my family was, I was raised, uh, agnostic at best. My family was, um, um, uh, my dad was a phys is a physician, was a physician, so he was I would I call a secular humanist, you know, yeah, um, and and that was fine. But I had always had I think some more spiritual inclinations um, that I kind of felt a little lonely about actually in a way. So um, I uh, we we're not raised in any church or faith environment in twenty. 16 or so, I uh, walked into a Catholic church and sat down with the deacon and I said, what is this about? Um, and uh, we talked for a while and I started some classes in Catholicism. There is a process called the Rite of Christian, um, what's it, RCIA, Initiation for Adults. It's kind of like... Uh, um, 
oh, you know, uh, a process of learning about the faith and so forth. So I ended up uh, converting to Catholicism in 2017. Um, and um, that in turn led me to uh, uh, pursue this uh, further education in, in, in theology. And I'm actually now applying for a doctorate in um, Buddhist ministry. So, um, yeah, so that's where my, <laughs> my, my, my path has been. Yeah. Has, has been leading me um yeah i say that's your question or yeah absolutely yeah and again you just re-emphasize what i was uh what i've already learned about you so far um just that endless pursuit of uh, knowledge and insight you know what i was getting at before is you know yeah uh, you, you would what would you say to yourself your 22 year old self now what kind of advice would you give to 20 or 22 year old phil reeves I would say, you know, generally is to uh, keep it small, be small in the sense of, um, you know, when I was younger, I had great, I wanted to get into film and television because I, I thought this has got great potentiality to change the world, to change people's views on things. And the older I get, I think, I, I realized that my my sphere of influence is getting smaller and smaller. I don't even know if it includes myself. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it just boils down to the one-on-one, -on -one, just the one-on-one -on -one interactions in our daily lives with people. That is just, to me, that is just getting looming larger and larger in importance. Um, and, you know... Um, and, and relinquishing, uh, let the chips fall where they may, you know, go out, to, you know, uh, there's that, uh, you know, Christ's greatest commandment, you know, love God with everything you've got and, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you can do that and then just let the chips fall where they may as best you can, that's a, that's a tall order. Yeah. But uh, if you can do that as best you can, um, you know, let the chips fall where they may, um, you know, it's, uh, it's it's it, it's the intentionality that counts, I think, um, more than the actual actuality of what happens. In other words, the, the actuality will take care of itself if your intentionality is in the, the right spot. There's that wonderful prayer by Thomas Merton where he says, um, he, he starts off, he goes, Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I don't see the road ahead of me. I can't know for certain where it will end. Um, the fact that I think I'm following your will doesn't mean I'm actually doing so. But I believe my desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope if I do that in all things, uh, you know, that uh, I'm doing the following the right path. So, you know, it's it's the intentionality more than the actual making things happen in, in your world. You know, just kind of letting that sort itself out if your intentionality is in the is in the right spot i don't know if that's answering your question i'm kind of blathering here but uh yeah um so and it's uh you know uh i think in larger political issues you know um gosh there's just so many times that you know i wish that you know if people could just take the time to um sit down and uh, uh, spend time with somebody else, you know, just and kind of let your agenda go and just try to listen to where that other person's coming from, who that person is. I mean, I think uh, large political movements tend to miss that step, you know, they, 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 they dehumanize people by going into the larger political push or perspective. And um, it's to me, you know, the older I've gotten, as I said, this, my sphere of influence seems to be smaller and smaller. It just comes down to, you know, just my interaction one on one with who I'm sitting down with right now, you know, um, 
and 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 trying to love them up as best I can. You know, not love them up maybe in a hallmark warm fuzzy way, but you know, wishing, <laughs> right. wishing, loving them and wishing them to be the best that they can be. You know what I mean? To 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 fulfill who they are uh, as as a human being. So anyway, I don't know. That's that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I should have said this at the outset. This is a discussion and not an interview. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So your answer is your answer. And it's great to hear your perspective. The podcast is really born out of division, trying to heal yes, the exactly. country, even one person at a time, if we can. And one thing we've been trying to focus on, if we can, is instead of talking about all the division constantly, can we talk about things that actually bring us together? Could you tell us in our listeners and our viewers about any situation that comes to mind, you know, where maybe two different uh, people or groups uh, came together, even though they were on different teams, so to speak, politically, socially, mm -hmm. economically. Does anything come to mind mm -hmm. that, uh, that you could help highlight for us? Um, well, again, it boils down, I can think of a couple of anecdotal situations. Um, and, uh, it's uh, one thing that comes to mind right now is uh, last December, um, the sheriff had a um, an interfaith uh, Zoom meeting where all of these folks from different faith communities were talking about um, you know how they see law enforcement and uh, community interaction with law enforcement and. Um, there was uh, an elder of a church, uh, predominantly black church in South LA, um, who uh, is, uh, was convicted uh, as a young man for homicide. Um, and um, as a result of this, we had a Zoom meeting and we all kind of shared our views on, you know, uh, community interactions with police and um as a result of that interaction he and i have actually kind of gotten close to each other uh you know um and uh we were able to kind of set aside uh agendas again and just interact with each other uh one-on-one -on -one. Uh, another example i guess i could give it, 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 the common denominator is the one on one interaction yeah was um, I am pursuing my um, certification as a in chaplaincy, it's a professional certification. And you have to take a series of, uh, of uh, classes or, or training courses called clinical pastoral education. Um, and uh, I took mine at uh, the um, uh, down at Hillel UCLA for the Academy for Jewish Religion. And one of my classmates was a former um, uh, Asian gangster. And wow. um, he and I, um, uh, it, it's interesting, uh, you know, here we are in this class with a, a number of academic people and, and, and uh, rabbinic candidates and so forth. Uh, he and I coming to this process from two sides of kind of the same coin in a way, yeah. found ourselves uh, drawn to each other. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we, uh, it's been, it's been a great process of discovery. So I, I think really, you know, all of these large uh, social issues, you know, we, ha we have to constantly remind ourselves that it boils down to the individual. That's where, that's what it's all about. Um, you know, and whenever you start to get into the us versus them view of the world, that's, that's, that's when you're in trouble. That's when the shite happens. You know, you, it's, <laughs> yeah. you really have to watch out for that. You have to be, you know, you have to be very, very careful about that. I, I mentioned before this, this Nigerian novelist, uh, this, uh, Adiche, uh, what was her name? Uh, uh, 
Shimamanda Adichie, she has this TED talk about uh, the danger of the single s story. I don't know, have you, are you familiar with that? No. It's a beautiful thing. If you get yeah. a chance to watch it, it's really super. And she talks about um, that uh, danger in her own life of reducing other people to a, a single story. And usually it's your projection on them of the yeah. single story. You're bringing your agenda to that interaction. And it's it's a painful, freaking, um, toilsome process to examine your own uh, <laughs> propensity to do that yeah. in any interaction you have with people. You have to really, really work at setting those triggers aside. I mean, we have them constantly, all day long, any interactions we have with other people. And it's just, uh, you know, you really have to work to keep that garden weeded because it the weeds are there they just in it you know i get it i mean we have these you know uh it's probably back to our neanderthal days when you know the outsider danger you know stranger danger yep. and you have to really ho 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 hold on a second here what's what's happening with this person you know um it's it's astonishing i one last quick thing and i'll stop blathering um you're fine the agency I worked for, one of the agencies I worked for was um, in the East San Gabriel Valley. Um, and there was, it was at the mouth of the San Gabriel River uh, uh, out of the, out of the mountains. And it was a big kind of floodplain and it was just a magnet for homeless people. Hmm. And, um, you know, I worked with homeless people a lot. And, um, it was so interesting uh, that, you know, with so many of them, the processes that I that I went through, you know, you you meet these people and immediately you're going to you're going to make a judgment about the way they look, the way they talk, the fact that they don't have any teeth, that they stink or whatever's going you know, on with them. And then you 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 realize, oh, wait a minute, there's a, there's there's a person underneath here. There's a whole story underneath here, a whole world. And um, it's just human nature for us to project a single story on other people. That's yeah. it. That's who you are. Boom. Got it nailed down. And you have to, you know, it takes work to uh, step back from that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, look at those triggers in yourself and de-agendize yourself. It's, it's, it's um, you know, it, it's, it's an ongoing process for sure, I think. Yeah, I think I agree. And the danger is not only in how you label others, but it's the label you apply to yourself automatically when you're introducing yourself. Yes. And you say, hi, my name is, and then you present your political affiliation, your group. Yeah, good point. Uh, whatever it may be. I'm a Republican, or I'm a white person, or I'm a male, or insert any other group affiliation here. Yes, exactly. Which again, instantly presents this single-sided view of yourself. Absolutely. Well, you know, the easy thing to do is, the easy work is, is groupthink. Yeah. And projecting labels on whole groups of people. Where the burger meets the cheese, the tough part of the work is just sitting down with somebody. Yeah. One-on-one. -on -one. Where are you coming from, man? You know, what's going on in your life? What's you know, what's happening and it, getting even beyond the words of what they're saying, you know, who, who they're at, who they are, where they're at, where their hurts are, where their ecstasies are, you know, um, that, that, that's work. <laughs> that, <laughs> that is work, not only, you know, for the engaging for the other person, but to setting aside your own triggers and temptations to skip that work and to go to that i'm it's much easier for me to make a, make a group ju judgment oh you're a white guy you know with classes or whatever and you're a part of that group or yeah. whatever you know um and and i think it's you know it's uh i talk about this with young cops all the time too is that you know uh, when you start those um little uh when that happens and it, it's human it happens all the time that's a little bell that's going off hey take a look at this now what's going on here with this why you know do i need to go there in terms of you know projecting onto this person or uh you know uh grouping this person rather than taking them as who they are and as an individual right here right now um, and, and it's, that's the work that's not easy to do. You have to really work on that. 
uh, constantly, I think. Yeah, for sure. Okay, Phil Reeves. Uh, I think we are at uh, almost an hour. Oh, wow. Time flies. Yeah, it does. We appreciate well, you're it. you're not wearing pants. It really <laughs> flies. <laughs> oh, man. Well, there's a great final visual for our viewers. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. you don't want that visual, believe me. You can't even our listeners uh, can visualize that. <laughs> Yeah, we appreciate your wisdom and experience and sharing everything with us. So uh, th so thank you very much. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you. Current Brian. projects or new projects that you want to inform our audience about? Anything you're working on coming up? In film and television? or just... Sure, anything. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm um, on a series now for ABC called uh, Home Economics. Mm -hmm. This is the second season that we're shooting right now. I'm, I'm loath to recommend anything I'm in because, you know, some people hate it, some don't like, you know, some like it. So, you know, it, it is what it is. But, um, you know, just keeping busy steadily with that and uh, keep doing the chaplaincy work and working on my master's and, you know, trying to keep my parole officer happy and, and I'm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm good. Yeah, your master's, your doctorate, your chaplaincy. Yeah. You've got a few irons in the fire. That's that's all right. Yeah, for sure. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, we thank you very much for joining us. It's been great. Thank you, brother. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my pleasure. And that's it for yeah. tonight. I'm signing off for Unity Now. Thanks, Phil Reeves. And good night, everyone. God bless. Thank you for watching the Unity Now podcast. We'll be back with another conversation that highlights the political middle ground to unite Americans and end the ideological war. In the meantime, we'd love to hear from you. Please comment below and hit that subscribe button.